This month's update was all about in-game events. Dynamically triggered and progressive PvE and PvP events, seasonal holidays, and that kind of thing. Lots of technical talk this month, but since I have the attention span of a hermit crab, and since you are a YouTube viewer, you probably do too, I am going to do a loose and colorful rendering of Stephen and Margaret's meticulous and well thought out words. Starting off, Stephen talked about dynamic PvE events, one of my personal favorite design philosophies of this project. There are many types of these events, but this is just an example. A goblin settlement arises just outside your node. At first, it will be just a few low-level goblin grunts, not causing too much harm. But if no one goes and gets rid of said goblins, their settlement will grow over time, and the goblins will begin affecting the world around them more and more, attacking and destroying buildings within the node, attacking players, etc. These increasing levels of effect on the world that dynamic events in Ashes will have happen in stages, causing more trouble at each each stage, eventually forcing you to deal with them because if you don't, those goblins may amass a small army and attack the node. Leading into the monster coin system we have been told about previously. Steven even said these various NPC factions like the goblins that will dynamically spring up and attack player nodes will have so-called hate lists relating to their specific race's lore, causing them to target specific buildings within a node. These types of dynamic events go beyond just groups of NPCs attacking a node. Freak weather events and storms will also happen and not merely have visual, functionally trivial effects. These types of weather events will affect crop rotations as well as spawn rates of gatherable herbs and animals. On top of PvE events like like the monster coin system and weather type events, Steven talked about open world events designed to create almost open world PvP battleground areas. This is what is known as the POI or point of interest system. These will be somewhat subtle indicators if a point of interest is in your area. Things along the lines of a mini boss spawning or maybe a griffin lays an egg and if you get to the egg first it contains a rare griffin mount. Every player in the immediate area will be notified that there is a POI. It won't tell them what it is or exactly where it is, but it will give them a general directional heading towards the point of interest. Thus, as players converge on this point, they will end up fighting over whatever limited time reward may be present in this point of interest. These POIs will also reward engaged and observant players, as they won't be as simple as notifications or a minimap ping. You may hear trees falling in the forest, and when you go to investigate, there is a giant troll miniboss going on a rampage. As far as seasonal events go, it seems like there will be a mix of seasonal events from real life mixed with uh, ones from totally just in-game lore. And even the real life ones will be altered a little bit to fit into the lore of the game world. A small but I think really interesting point, they briefly talked about resource renewability. That being that if you go to the same place and collect the resource too many times, that resource may not spawn back as readily as it did before. This creates a natural scarcity in the world and a need to explore and have multiple zones where you gather your resources. Environment Art Next, we have some updates on the Pyre Elves, and specifically we were shown more concept art of their architecture, which is always a welcome sight, being that theirs is some of the most beautiful of any race's architecture we have been shown. We were also shown a couple images of some alien human ruins set in the Riverlands, which are the Ayla humans' original birthplace. Next, and this was not fully ready to be shown off in the way they want to yet, but we were shown some preliminary images of different seasons. These were just images of what looks like the peak of each season, but from the sound of it, very soon, possibly even next month, we are going to be seeing the full transitions between these seasons. And another massive raid boss has been revealed to end this month's update stream off. Intrepid's designers never cease to amaze me with this kind of thing. This thing just looks amazing. Not quite as large in scale as the massive Negalith Ocean Raid boss from last month's update, but still a big boy. There was a particularly large number of really good questions asked in this month's Q&A section. So if you don't mind, I'll take a back seat on the narration and just play this footage outright. Carthos wants to know naval combat. 
Uh, can I equip my ship with a ram and plow into other ships and maybe raid bosses to inflict damage while not completely yes, wrecking my there, own ship? There might be particular ship components and or classes that excel at that type of activity. And then we've got uh, questing lore from Dismas, and they want to know, will we be processing through an overarching story and chapters of a narrative or will it largely be exploration and contained in small regional quest lines dotted throughout the world both yeah. um, there will be a healthy dose of both of those um, that the the approach of the narrative team um, is that there is of course a meta story that meta story gets informed by regional stories and regional outcomes and um uh, depending on how players progress within their personal stories, that could be either racially based or um, could be uh, their class based. Um, they could be uh, per node basis. Like all of those things support the grand structure of the meta narrative, but that's how you effectuate kind of outcomes. Uh, the next question is about mounts, in, and this is from Lashing, and they would like to know will gliding tier two mounts have to sacrifice speed, other stats, or an ability slot to keep tier one mounts relevant? No, tier one route mounts are relevant. Um, and this is something that's going to be explained in our stable systems and how mounts are accounted uh, for uh, later on. Um, we haven't gotten into an article about the stable systems yet or, or discussed really how they work. Mm -hmm. um, but generally you're gonna have active mounts and those active mounts, um, I'll just, I'll tease this a little bit. The active mounts are determined based on um, you <clears throat> having that active mount as part of a slot within the stable that you, um, you're within the area of. Um, and what that means is that mounts are relevant in battle. And if you lose your mount in battle, it's, it's, it is a detriment. There are ways for you to bring that mount back. There are active potions that you can have available to you to do fast resurrections, um, to reduce that cooldown potentially. And you can also interface with the stable itself if you want to uh, swap that mount out, mount out with a different mount. Uh, but uh, tier one mounts will have certain typed types of abilities that are unique to the tier ones and the tier twos will have certain abilities that are unique to the tier twos in some cases those will be horizontal um, in other cases they'll be vertical power game how do you plan to balance professions to keep them equally useful and relevant at end game well, that's it's hard balance question. is a hard question i was gonna say it's that's not a, that's it's a it's a big question mm -hmm. um, uh, balance is um, you know, of course, something that is done through testing, through iteration, um, and uh, and also watching player behavior. So, um, <clears throat> you know, when it comes to balancing a system, that's something that we do during testing phases. When it comes to architecting the system itself and identifying the areas in which certain certain professions excel, um, where they interact with ancillary systems, their interconnectivity across the artisanship system as a whole, um, you know, the the important part there is to identify um, how that the the interconnectivity lives with the other professions in the artisanship system um, and, and, and what type of reliance you have on particular professions uh, to complete the path of crafting or introduction of new items into the economy. Um, and I think that <coughs> one of the things you need to strive to do is not to create arbitrary and one-off bespoke professions that aren't part of that integration, that whole holistic kind of view of the profession system. Um, Corey and Mike are doing a great job in um, kind of identifying uh, the importance of each profession across the artisanship as a whole. And right now we have 20, I believe we have 22 professions um, and we're talking about masteries, like ultimate masteries uh, living with within only two of those to start uh, for any one individual character. That doesn't mean that, that you can't achieve like tier three and tier four um, um, intermediate proficiency within those systems and have some uh, some interaction across the whole, 
But when it comes to complete mastery, we're really kind of identifying around two or three right now. All in all, on a surface level, not quite as impactful as last month's update where they revealed the character creator. But for me personally, I deeply enjoyed the long and thoughtful technical talk from Stephen and Margaret. And I will be re-watching this update multiple times to really let all that sink into my little goldfish brain. Anyways, thank you for watching this video. A like would help me out and I highly recommend going and checking out the full VOD of the development update on your own. I will leave that link at the top of the description. Also follow my Twitch as I will be streaming here and there before Alpha 2 drops and every day once Alpha 2 is here.